In fact, I gotta go up there. We're not retired. Yeah, I gotta go get a big spray. Yeah. 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 Good evening, everybody. Good evening. How are y'all doing tonight? Good. 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 Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We're the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As at Meribah, as in the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had not seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said they are a people who err in their heart. And they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger, truly, they shall not enter into my rest. So he's basically saying, don't be like them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Learn from their mistakes mm -hmm. and come and worship me and know who I am. Amen. Amen. Good start. So it says to come and worship and bow down. And our first two songs. Uh, come straight out of that line. <laughs> yes. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. And come, just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, and come. One day every tongue will confess you are God, one day every knee will bow, still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Oh, come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart and come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God and come. Oh, come, yeah, come. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For he is our God, and 
we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand, just the sheep of his hand. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand, just the sheep of his hand. We're the sheep of his hand, just the sheep of his hand. If you uh, want a hymnal, it's 571, or the words will be on the screen too. If you'd like to hold the hymnal, you can certainly do that. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but it's blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delight of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are with them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, amazing grace. 
chasing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree. Your grace falls down and covers me. Covers me. It covers me. It covers me. It covers me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down, from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree, your grace flows down and covers me. Covers me, covers me, it covers me, it covers me. We're in the book of Acts tonight. In chapter 12. A couple of quick announcements for you. Of course, we're having a volunteer recognition on Sunday, and we're going to have a dinner in the evening, trying to be a blessing to the ladies and not mess up the kitchen too much. So, um, the men have spoken a little bit. They've decided to do some hamburgers, hot dogs, try to keep the kitchen clean. And uh, then also they'll do some sides. So if you want to help bring some of those, either bring a nice cold watermelon or if you want to bring mac and cheese to go with that men or a potato salad to go with that or something like that. Now, don't make your wife cook it. You know, come on, be nice, right? Or if you want to bring some potato chips or something, but... Uh, we'll do hamburgers, hot dogs with some sides for Sunday night's dinner. Any questions about that? Is it next weekend? No, it's this, this Sunday. This Sunday? It is. Oh. It's, it's Does that honest. mean I don't have to cook? <laughs> it means you don't have to cook Sunday night. Oh. That's all. Oh. I would never say something like that because I know Sid enjoys your cooking, so I'm not going to. You should cook for Sid, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I like it. So, uh, yeah, so this, this Sunday, which is also our regular business meeting Sunday, so the, we normally do the family dinner. We're going to do the same type of a thing, except it'll be volunteer recognition, try to love on our ladies, not have them have to serve on us and all that kind of stuff. So the men will serve. It'll be good. Amen. Any questions about that? And dessert. Should always be some dessert, right? So mm -hmm. does that mean the men's making the dessert? If we wanted to pull out the stops, maybe some of them, maybe they know how to make homemade ice cream or something. I don't know, but we'll see. Or maybe they can go to the store and buy some ice cream. I don't know. Or, or maybe watermelon is the dessert. I'm not sure, but we'll see what we can do. So Sid, make a shopping list. Good stuff. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Oh, really? And I'll show you that that's broken. That's the best All right. And you're sure he made it, huh? 
Yes, he does make them. Okay, amen. Hallelujah. It's good stuff. Praise the Lord. As we get started tonight, of course, uh, it is September the 11th, and so I wanted to be mindful that we would pause and just spend a little time in prayer, and we might even tell some of those stories about where you were. It's one of those days you'll never forget. You'll never forget where you were. Um, and so we want to be mindful of the fact that not only did people lose their lives who were in the towers, but obviously our first responders that ran toward the danger, many of them lost their lives or developed health problems later as a result of that. We also don't want to forget that the very next day, people were signing up to go serve in the military. Uh, they didn't know necessarily where we were going, but they knew that we would be going soon. And so they were ready and signed up, and were ready to go. And of course, uh, we want to be mindful of all those that gave their life in that way. So, but never forget. That's right. We were singing uh, Amazing Grace and God Bless America on the Capitol steps, and everybody found their Bible, and it lasted, what, a couple months, and then all of a sudden it dissipated. So, I remember where I was. Uh, I was the headmaster of a Christian school in Houston, Texas. And I was already at work and receiving kids. And we weren't, the first bell hadn't rung yet. We weren't in session yet. It was still early. And I remember getting a phone call and uh, Don called and said, hey, hey, do you have a TV on? I said, well, that's not my usual. You know, I'm trying to get school started here. So no, I don't have a TV. I need to turn on the TV. Something's just happened. So turn on the TV and see what's going on. And as I'm turning on TV and they're reporting on the first plane that hit, then while I'm watching that, the second plane hit, like many of you remember. And uh, then I'm like, I call the church office and say, hey, are y'all know what's going on? Well, our senior pastor happened to be on a plane <laughs> headed to a conference in Chicago. And uh, one of our head associates and, and the two of them were flying and they obviously were immediately grounded, you know, didn't get to their destination, and then they had to try to find a rental car to get back to Houston. And so, of course, everybody has a story. Uh, my day was filled with making sure children were protected, uh, making sure children got connected with their parents, got home safely, and lots of prayer that day, uh, making sure that our church as a whole was well cared for, uh, one of the things, in addition to the fact that I knew God was obviously in charge, sure didn't hurt to have uh, fighter pilots flying over Houston like that. And so I was like, oh, okay, it's one of those days. So that may not have been happening here. I'm not sure I wasn't here, but for me in Houston, we had fighter jets flying over the city pretty quick. And I was like, okay, uh, I feel safe. <laughs> you know, they're looking out for us. They're watching out for us. But it was uh, quite a quite a day. It's a day where we stopped our regular schedule. And so uh, sometimes after 18 years have passed, we, we don't pause as much as we should. And so I don't just want to remember the lives that were given, though that's important. I want to remember how good our God is and uh, how he watched over us and he cared for us. And even with those who maybe went through a whole lot more trauma than we did, he was still faithful every step of the way. And so I want to be mindful of that. Anyone else want to just share? Do you have something you want to say? My little, my granddaughter, who was only about two and a half, her babysitter lived where she heard the plane from Stewart Field all the time. And she remembers that day because it was the day the plane didn't fly. How about that? And she was only maybe two and a half. Right. The day planes <laughs> didn't fly. The day. She was so used to hearing that picture. Right. Made a big impression on her. Sure. That was the day the planes didn't fly. Yeah. Dawn's sister was in New York, and so I can remember we were trying to find her and make sure she was safe. And, you know, I'm sure y'all have stories like that too. Yes, sir. I was a huge yeah, we were hanging out together. <laughs> working in Houston, and uh, I'd been working on paperwork in my travel trailer. I didn't have TV on mm -hmm. to take up to the main office. 
next stop, start driving off the main road. I know it's always spotted. Yeah. Yeah. That'll change your life. what they're doing. Yeah. And our office was right next to the airfield where they took off. Mm -hmm. and when I got there, man, they were just. Yep. When I walked in, I couldn't find anybody in the office to turn in my paperwork. <laughs> That's right. Something was going on. So I walked around to where our meeting room was, that TV. That's the first I knew of that. Mm -hmm. And I got there about, I've been up in the office there watching TV just a few minutes when the second jet hit the tower. Mm -hmm. It was a day that nobody did it. Right? We just it. Hopefully you prayed. That's, right. That's what we did. We prayed. <laughs> right? But we didn't do any work that day. We yeah. Hopefully people try to connect with God and ask him, right? What was up? Anyone else want to share before we get into our Bible study or before we pray? I was a sophomore in college trying to get ready for class and mm -hmm. my uh, roommate burst in through and she's like, Did you hear what happened at the first tower? I was like, No, the T V wasn't on, you know. Uh, and I turned on and the second plane hit. And we were supposed to go uh, have band practice out at the old San Angelo Stadium. Mm -hmm. And there was not a dry eye during that band practice. And, and if I remember correctly, the plane that hit um, in Pennsylvania was really close to where Rita's brother lived at the time. So it's almost in their backyard. I'm sure your day was busy, Phil. Was that a busy day for you? It was. It was. I bet. <clears throat> and I was actually on duty. You know. <clears throat> Fire department, and of course, not knowing what was all taking place when everything was kind of high alert. Mm -hmm. Ms. Sue, did you have something you want to share? It looked like you thought about it. No, I, I, I was to remember, I know we all, we Saturday to next Saturday, we all know we were in the courtyard at Monday. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it was Saturday, it wasn't Saturday. I know that 9-11 started my inspection. Oh, wow. Every three-year inspection, yeah, it started that, and they all, interesting. <coughs> but they were all glad, they were, all the surveyors that came were glad they were here, mm -hmm. because it was a faith-based organization. We did stop to pray and do yeah. those kinds of things, and they said they felt very good that they were in a place that was looking towards God. Amen. James, you have something you want to share? Yeah. Uh, when I first went in the Army uh, in boot camp, they put us in for these educational series in the theater, and all the doors were shut. It was pretty dark. Somebody was speaking and all this stuff. This guy butts into what's going on, comes up there and says, excuse me, I have to announce this message. We are now at war with the Soviet Union. All people be aware that we're preparing for war. Now. And we've been isolated from all kinds of news, all kinds of everything. Everybody was just totally shocked and awe. I mean, it was totally shocked. And then... After that was said and done, the response of the guy correct. This could actually happen at any time, but we need to be ready. Right. And everybody we wanted to shoot the guy. I bet they they want to take care of him. On. So when that announcement came out about what was happening, I was driving. I, I thought, it, is this going to be a bigger thing? Is this finally going to be all the people that complained about all the wars we were fighting somewhere else? Yada yada. Yeah, yeah. We were fighting here. wars and people were dying 16,000 miles away. That's okay. Is war coming to the mainland? Right. Finally, are we getting so liberal that we're letting this stuff come over? And then I thought, how much courage when I heard that that third plane was heading for the Pentagon. Right. Those guys jumped the guys with they had razor blades. Box open is what they had, but it took enough courage for them to know that they were going to die anyway, but they wouldn't let any more people die than what was on that plane. That took a lot of courage. Amen. And America's always had people step up in the courage department when it really got serious. Preach. 
And I think if that power is the reason why we're over in Afghanistan and we're over there in Iraq, and the reason we're over in both of them, Iraq, is the oil and the poppy flower and the dope that's in Afghanistan. Let it be known it's about money. And that's why they're still involved in the yes. They're we lots of it. Especially even today, yesterday, tomorrow, there's lots of shows about, you know, getting it time to stop this war, et cetera. See, I'm sure you'll have your fill of that if you want to listen to it. So let's pause and, and pray, and then we can get into our Bible study. I just thought it was important that we take a moment tonight. So let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we're mindful of how you uh, protected us 18 years ago when uh, we we lived through something that changed our lives in so many different ways, and yet uh, you were with us, and we thank you. And so we pause and we remember the lives lost, and we also remember the courage of our first responders and all of those that were trying to help and rescue and save, and we can't help but through all of that, because we know you, we think about Jesus too, and how he gave his life that we might have life to the fullest, that we might have forgiveness. Father, we pray for those still battling. There are people who are still traumatized and people who lost loved ones that day and people who, anytime this day comes, they mourn, they grieve. Would you minister to them, Lord? I'm so thankful that you can minister by way of your Holy Spirit all over the globe. Would you touch each heart? Would you touch each life? Would you hold them and keep them and sustain them and bring healing to them in the precious name of Jesus Christ? Father, we pray for the lost. I've heard story after story after story of uh, men who were in high-powered business meetings just a few days prior to 9-11 and were just overly compelled by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel at times when they wouldn't normally share the gospel in the middle of conducting business, they were just overwhelmed that people in that room needed to know Jesus and they would share. And then later they'd look upon it and say, yeah, they were in the tower that day. I hope that they gave their life to Christ. Father, thank you for how you watch over us and you protect us. We're also mindful of our country and the current condition, the current temperature, and we long for the nation as a whole to bow down before you in worship. We long for the nation as a whole to repent and to just absolutely let your word and your love and your name and your gospel flood back into uh, every area of school and every area of our government and every area of our country because you are God. There is God. Father, have your way. Accomplish all you desire to accomplish. We celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a quick thing. A yeah. water world. Uh, I got it that water uh -huh. this morning. So he was 23 years old the day this happened. And he said, the world he knew before 9 11, he never had that world again. Everything. Wanted his children, and, and every, everyone should tell their children this truth. Right. Yeah, there's, yeah, and there's a, uh, some research taking place right now that there are many, since it was 18 years ago, there are many children today that don't know. Mm -hmm. And so they're talking about the, the importance to make sure it's in the textbooks and make sure that it's a part of American history and that they're going to learn that and not just say, I wonder what that was about, because, you know, it's not necessarily in the textbooks. And so we, we not only need to tell them, but we need to make sure that no one forgets the story. It's always better when God's in the story. <laughs> Amen? Then when people try to lead him out. Acts chapter 12, let's take a look. We've got about 20 minutes together. It says, now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And it was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison. 
delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. And on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and roused him, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. He went out and continued to follow. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out, went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, oh, it's an angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. He said, report these things to James and the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards in order that they be led away to execution. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. He was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And with one accord, they came to him, having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain. They were asking for peace because their country was fed <laughs> by the king's country. And on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. People kept crying out, the voice of God and not of man, the voice of God and not of man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. He was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Amen. So though many have tried... It's really silly to fight against God. Think about it. It's kind of a losing battle, isn't it? So here's a short reminder of those who have tried just pulling some out. By the way, the list is long, um, so it's extensive. Hopefully we're not on the list. Hopefully you're, you have stopped fighting against God. Amen? So here's just some, just through history, who were adamant. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche despised Christianity. And he uh, called it the religion of the weak. Fighting God eventually pushed him over the brink. He spent the last several years of his life insane. Novelist Sinclair Lewis, winner of the 1930 Nobel Peace Prize. I was going to ask who was around, but I'm just kidding. Um, for literature, also thought he could fight God. His novel, Elmer Gantry, mocked Christianity. Uh, its lead character was an evangelist who was also an alcoholic and an unceasing fornicator. Lewis's fight against God cost him his sobriety. He died a hopeless drunk. Another Nobel Peace Prize winner author, Ernest Hemingway, considered himself living proof that one could successfully fight God. He boasted of fighting in revolutions and sweeping women off their feet and leading a life of sin without any consequences. Anybody remember how he died? His sins eventually found him out. He put a shotgun to his head kill himself. Fighting against God cost him his life. 
Let's see what the scriptures have to say concerning the issue. We see evidence. It says there's no wisdom and no understanding, no counsel against the Lord. Right? It's it's his. He's the one who knows what's true, what's right, what's good. Who are we to think that we know something better? Isaiah says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. All the nations are as nothing before him. They're regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Of course, we also know he is the one, God is the one who allows there to be kings and governors and leaders. He puts them in place. He allows them that privilege. In the Bible, we can see that there are all kinds of kings and pharaohs who tried to fight against God and they lost. We remember the plagues of the Exodus, right? Pharaoh's army drowning in the sea. We remember names in the wilderness like the king of Sihon and Og and Balak and many others. Even people within God's very own kingdom tried to fight against him, right, and failed. Oh, so many of the kings of the northern kingdom were fighting against God, right? Various kings from both kingdoms within the nation fought against God. The consequences were devastating for them, for the land, for the people. It wasn't good. In today's passage, we see King Herod Agrippa the first fighting against God. It doesn't go well. When will we ever learn? God's way is always the best way. Amen. We should submit to him and do it his way. Here are three really good reasons tonight never to find yourself fighting against God. Number one, God's power cannot be contested. No one's more powerful than God. Right? God's punishment cannot be avoided. Right? People think they get away with something. You're not going to get away with it. There's this thing called Judgment Day. Right? God's purpose cannot be frustrated. His purposes will be accomplished with or without you. You might as well get on board. Right? You might as well be part of the solution instead of part of the pollution. Amen. It's important. So the first one, God's power cannot be contested. We see Peter's in prison, right? The church is praying. That word fervently means that they were they were serious. They weren't playing games. They were passionate about prayer. They were extending themselves in prayer. They were storming the heavens on Peter's behalf. James had already been put to death by the sword, right? And the plan was to kill Peter. And they're praying, no, Lord. Set him free, Lord. Break the chains, Lord. Open the gates, Lord. Hallelujah, that's good stuff. That very night, Herod was about to bring him forward. Peter was sleeping. We talked about that on Sunday. He was confident in his God. Four squads of soldiers, there's... Four in each squad, so you have 16 that are guarding him. That's probably enough, right? Just keep one man subdued, cared for. Him. Yep. We have people watching him, people watching the prison, people at each one of the gates. Herod thought he had everything under control. He got this. No problem, right? He had Peter right where he wanted him. It's going to work out good, right? He, uh, he thought when the time was right, you know, I can have Peter killed. I'll go down in history as the king that snuffed out Christianity. We took care of business. He's thinking pretty highly of himself, isn't he? Right? Peter could sleep confidently because he knew Jesus had already promised him a long life. Y'all remember that wonderful story where Jesus shows up and he's calling Peter to himself. Peter is already denied Christ and he's having Peter come to him and they're having that conversation. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. I love you like a brother. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. He's walking through that concept of feed my sheep, tend my lambs, etc. It's on that very day he told Peter, Peter, you're going to have a nice, long life of ministry. Hallelujah. Peter knew he wasn't dying early, right? Here it is, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish, Peter. But when you grow old, you're going to stretch out your hand, someone else is going to gird you, bring you where you do not wish to go. We're going over here, Peter. Come with us, right? Promised him a long life. 
people who trust God's promises and take him at his word, they usually sleep for a bit. Peter's like, God's got this. I don't know how he's going to do it yet, but he's got it. I can sleep tonight. Another reason why Peter could make the following statement in 1 Peter 5, because of his confidence in the Lord, because of his holding fast to his promises, he could say things like this. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he might exhaust you at the proper time. Cast your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. He can make statements like that because he was confident in the promises of his God and in the power of his God. So to get back to our main text, the angel of the Lord appears. The light shines in the cell. Peter has to be woken up pretty vigorously, right? We see this word that he's roused. He's struck in the side there. It's time to get up. Get up quickly. Chains fall off of his hands. And it's like Peter needs help. He's still not fully awake. So the angel's having to give him instructions. Gird yourself. Oh, okay. Put your sandals on. Oh, where are those sandals? I can't find those sandals, right? Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. We're getting some very specific, the kind you get in the army, right? It's not just go mop the floor. It's go to the closet, get the bucket, get the mop, put some hot water in that, get the soap, put it in there. But, you know, you're getting all that. The angel's leading him through. Each step, right? Goes out to follow, didn't realize it was really happening, thought it was a vision. Passed by the first guard, second guard, the iron gate just starts to open all by itself. He's like, oh my, this is really happening. God has really shown up in power. He knows for sure the Lord rescued him from the hand of Herod. He knows for sure that what the Jews intended to happen isn't going to happen. They're going to be sorely disappointed, right? Pretty exciting stuff. Guess Herod wasn't in charge after all. Thought he was, right? No prison can hold those who God wants free. That's not just physically. That's also spiritually. That's also any bondage of sin, unforgiveness, resentment, Anger, hatred, wrath, any of those things that want to hold you in a prison, fear, anything that wants to hold you in a prison because of the power of Almighty God, nothing can hold you. Right? He can set you free. Hallelujah. I wonder what's going to happen when Herod finds out that Peter's gone missing. Oops. They come, it's no small disturbance, it's a big deal. Soldiers can't find Peter. Peter, where'd he go? Herod comes and searches, can't find him, examines the guards, gives orders for their execution. Couldn't do your job. You had one job. <laughs> Out of all y'all, not one of you seen anything. That's right. So he's had enough. He even has got to get out of town. He's so fed up. He's out of here. He's leaving from Judea to go to Caesarea. He's got to go to his vacation home for a little while. He's so discombobulated, right? Say that Herod was mad <clears throat> would be an understatement. He was livid. He was upset. For some reason, he couldn't see his own stuff. He couldn't see his own sin. He couldn't see his own shortcomings. All he could do was find fault in other people, right? He couldn't see that fighting against God was <coughs> foolish and pointless. He only saw other people's faults. Things definitely weren't headed in a good direction for him, right? So it's important to note one of the reasons Peter went to the house where several were gathered to pray was to testify of God's uncontestable power. Amen. Hey, y'all were praying, weren't you? Mm -hmm. We were. You were praying for me to get out tonight, weren't you? We were. We were shocked that you're here, Peter. God did it. God did it. He did it. I'm free. Woo! Hallelujah. Say, well, it may be, it may be his spirit outside. Yeah, it might be an angel. It might be his guardian angel. He's already done. Yeah, he's gonna go ahead. Sure, there's some political move going on. No, there. No, it's Peter. Then they're getting loud. He has to be quiet. What are y'all doing? You gonna get me caught again? Keep this thing quiet. So God's punishment cannot be avoided, right? He's angry. He's probably transferring <coughs> some of this anger from what took place, right? In Judea, he's probably so miffed, he's like taking it out on the poor people of Tyre and Sidon. And so 
they're going to be approaching him saying, look, give us some relief. They influenced the chambermaid, right, the chamberlain. Uh, the chamberlain is the particular servant that takes care of the bed chambers. And so they, they've got an in with the person that's kind of close to the king to say, yeah, can we make peace because this is getting old, right? So they get a voice and they're going to talk to him and they're asking for peace. Though Herod wasn't directly in charge of these cities, he had oversight of the trade route that was coming from Jerusalem. He controlled supplies and economy to some degree. People wanted peace. They hoped Herod would loosen his grip on the area. On an appointed day, Herod had put on his royal pair, took his seat at the rostrum, began delivering an address. I bet he was impressed with himself. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, the occasion was a feast in honor of the Roman emperor Claudius. That was the appointed day. We're going to honor Claudius. Josephus adds, Herod wore a garment made wholly of silver, and its brilliance was illuminated by the rays of the morning sun. So he's glowing while he speaks. Overwhelmed by his splendor, the people began to refer to him as a god. People kept crying out, the voice of God, not of man, the voice of God, not of man. <clears throat> he didn't correct them. He was like, yeah, let me hear that a little bit more. Yeah, I like the way that sounds. Uh-oh. It says an angel of the Lord struck him down immediately. He didn't give God the glory. He was eaten by worms and died. According to Josephus, the Jewish historian here had lingered on for five days in terrible pain. Amid all his pomp and all his majesty, he suffered a horrible and shameful death, eaten by worms. So ended the reign and the life of the man who had dared to touch two of God's apostles and fight against God. So we see some of the consequences of unbelief in the book of Romans. You've probably seen these, but in case you were thinking about fighting against God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. God made it evident to them. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over, in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Maybe we should choose as an act of our free will to trust God and take him at his word. Trust him. We should believe him. We should obey him. We should experience the fullness of his blessings. So we've looked at his power cannot be contested. His punishment cannot be avoided. And then the Last one, his purposes cannot be frustrated. It's just the last two verses of the chapter, right? The word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. I guess Herod's scheme didn't work, right? Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem where they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Luke keeps us on track with the church's growth by reporting that despite the furious opposition of men, the word of the Lord continued to grow and multiply. Though Herod died, the ministry of Jesus and his church lives on. So let's choose to partner with God instead of fighting against him. Amen. Hallelujah. Any questions on chapter 12? I went a little fast since we spent time in uh, talking about September 11. Questions about chapter 12 and not fighting against God tonight. Going back to Rhoda and the, and the peace and the Lord Peter, why did the people not go out there for themselves? I mean, they were so like, oh, and just letting this girl say, well, he's out there, he's out there. But me being me, I would have gone out there and looked. Right. 
And yeah. eventually they did. It's just, uh, you have a couple things. First of all, she's a servant girl. And so, and they're busy and it's late. They're in the middle of praying. They're still meeting and still gathered. And so they don't really want to be bothered with a knock at the door. And so when the servant girl comes and says, it's Peter, they're like, oh, but someone go help her. Because she needs help. Bless her heart. She needs, she needs a little help. Someone go help her. So that's kind of the picture that we see here. Of course, there are songs written about it. I think it was Larnell Harris and others that used to sing. Rhoda, open the door. Pretty fun stuff. Anything else about it? Yes. There's one thing here that didn't fit. Yeah. And looking at it from a human side, it's perfectly logical with exactly what we would think would happen. But looking at it from God's view of this, and it's more your point for us. In verse 7, it says, uh, He smoked Peter on his side and raised him up, saying, Arise and go quickly. Mm -hmm. Why did it happen? The angel moves. Yeah. God was in charge. Sure. You know, I mean, it looks like God made them control. Certainly. And so, yeah, he's kind of unlikely they have to hurt. What's the hurry? Yeah. 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 What's the hurry? Somebody on an unnervous ass. What's the hurry? Amen. Amen. I forgot. James, oh, he must have never right. spent a night in jail waiting to get bailed out. And then started. that's all I can say. There you go. Can understand that real quick about it. Let's go, Peter. We got places to be. But why I think that is standard for the Bible, if somebody's poking at the side of you, wouldn't you holler or something? Right, or would I have been groggy? So. Well, and the chain's falling off, and all that is happening, but not silent. Yeah. God saw to it, but the guards saw to it. Yeah, in the supernatural, those guards probably weren't moving any kind of sense. So. Good stuff. Anything else for tonight? Uh, Rita just had asked me earlier that um, Rita Jordan's grandson is ready to have back surgery for his spina bifida foot. Uh -huh. And uh, the mother and grandmother would ask for us to. Something Ryland or Ryland, something like that. Rig is the last Rigan. 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 Yeah. Rigan's been R I G G A N. R I G G A N. And the surgery specifically. It's it's the back surgery for a spine of the We're really walking that we're in the clinic. Isn't Rigan's house like having to have sex for them too? That's, uh, yeah, um, Lonnie Jordan is supposed to have this more stuff for them. Okay. Yeah. Might be the granddaddy of that thing. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. I received a call from a friend of mine today, uh, Ron Archer. His wife was having a lot of problems. She had cancer. Uh -huh. She did radiation on her. She had to have surgery on her tailbone. There wasn't no uh, one thing there was was skin. There ain't no pressure. It could have burned off during the radiation. I sewed it up. I had to break the tailbone. Ouch. And, uh, now, they didn't have any flesh to force them yeah. into. Now she's got an infection, bad infection. Yeah. They're trying to do something. I forgot what he told me. Some kind of like a, he said, it's like a vacuum cleaner trying to pull off. <laughs> What's her first name? Do we know? Paula. Paula. That's Paula correct. Archer. Oh, yes. Okay. Just a quick update on Tim. Um, they did discover he has a fractured rib, which is what was causing a lot of the pain on his left side when he tries to breathe. He was having 
localized pain, and so um, they're going to uh, watch him for a couple of days. Hopefully, he'll be released by Friday. They're also concerned that he's got some pneumonia issues. So uh, there is some good news. The good news is, is they finally got insurance, and it looks like they're going to be able to get an appointment uh, to go through the evaluation process to get on the list for a liver. And so uh, if he can get well enough, they'll make a trip to San Antonio soon to go through that evaluation process. So be in, in prayer for those things. Right. My, my brother had a, that passed away, had a friend and his wife that were missionaries to Mexico. And in March, they had a bad accident here in San Antonio. And uh, I've been texting her to keep up with it because he was telling me what was going on with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, she said that she may be able to start learning to walk. So, mm -hmm. Mark, this has been going on since March. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's something that Marty and Linda said. This guy, you can't be around him. Yeah, this is very uh, with the Lord. I mean, he is on fire. Amen. And if you're having you on fire, it's better than Amen. 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 Anything else before we pray? Good to be here with you tonight. Let's close in prayer. Father, what a privilege to be together uh, and gather in your name. We thank you for your church. Have your way. Lord, we lift up all of these that have been mentioned with a variety of health issues and needs, some facing surgery, some recovering, some still having uh, more chemo, more radiation, other treatments ahead of them, some battling infections. Father, uh, Thank you that you are our healer. Thank you that uh, you can use those amazing things of our modern technology, medicine, doctors and nurses, and all the machinery and equipment that's available to us these days that used to not be to pinpoint things that need improvement and bring solutions. Father, we ask that you bring healing to these that were mentioned tonight, that you would watch over them and care for them, that you would hold them and keep them and sustain them, that literally you would breathe life to them in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. Have your way. We thank you for this one that's about to start walking, and we give you praise. Father, we think of this one that's about to have back surgery. We ask, Lord, your hand would be upon them. Father, bring your healing touch to each one of those circumstances. Be with us tonight as we head home. Watch over us and protect us and Give us sweet sleep as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good night. <laughs>